My name is Katie Schubert. I serve as the Deputy Director of the Coalition for Health Funding. I work at a government relations firm called CRD Associates. Before I put you all to sleep, um, I didn't have my act together this morning. I wanted to add one slide uh, to sort of talk about my own personal story um, to help sort of let you know who I am, um, who's talking to you. But my, uh, it would have been a picture of my nephew Gabriel uh, wearing a Captain America snow cap. Uh, in about two feet of snow in Connecticut. <laughs> um, he is also my godson. He is my oldest son's best friend. Um, and he is actually a guitarist at the age of six. He also has a chromosome disorder. It's extremely rare. Um, there's only one published case of this. Um, and so my sister, his mother, is his greatest advocate. And I tell you all that to let you know that it's, it's very important that you're here and that you're telling your stories and that you put this into context for people. Um, you know, I mentioned I was talking to my sister this morning. I wanted to make sure she was okay with me sharing this. And she said, oh yes, we have to talk about this and make sure you let them know that I am so proud of them for coming today um, and participating in this week and that I hope to be there in the next few years. If everybody's doing it, I should be doing it too. So um, thank you all. And now on to the boring things. <laughs> um, so this is just a little bit about my background. Uh, CRD Associates, where the Coalition for Health Funding is housed, founded in 1980. Um, and that was our little team there. Uh, the Coalition for Health Funding, where I serve as deputy director, was founded in 1970. Um, we're the largest nonprofit alliance to preserve and strengthen public health investments. Um, we have nearly 100 members. I'm hoping that this slide in the future will say we have over 100 members. Um, and we advocate for the public health continuum. All of the public health discretionary programs, including at the National Institutes of Health, CDC, HRSA, uh, SAMHSA, ARC, FDA, Indian Health Service, uh, anything out of HHS. Um, before we get into sort of the nitty gritty, I wanted to just go over a couple of terms of art uh, within the federal budget process. So mandatory versus discretionary. Um, discretionary spending, which is what I will be referring to throughout this presentation, is that spending which is at Congress's discretion uh, to allocate. It doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that they, it's at their discretion to appropriate this funding each year through the annual appropriations process. There's two types of discretionary spending, defense and non-defense. Um, defense is military spending, and non-defense, or NDD, is everything else. So that includes research, education funding, um, food safety, drug safety, airlines, uh, public safety, criminal justice, everything else. And then the other type of spending is mandatory. Um, that is spending that's enacted by law. It does not go through the annual appropriations process. The only way to change spending on programs like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security is to change, uh, change the law. So what exactly am I talking about when I talk about discretionary spending? I personally am talking about this 1.61% of the federal budget that's discretionary health. So a teeny tiny part of the federal budget. Um, that's where we look for funding out of NIH. That's where we look for funding out of FDA. Um, I have in a report that I'll mention later uh, that the Coalition for Health Funding wrote in 2014, a timeline. And it shows all of the public health programs throughout your lifespan that may have impacted you in some way. Um, and this is that 1.61%, but you can see it from before birth all the way to the end of life, um, public health programs do impact you uh, throughout the entirety. So one more term I wanted to put in here, we hear a lot about budget deficit, a lot about the debt, what does that mean? Um, the deficit is just the difference between what's coming in and what's going out. And the debt is the total amount of money owed to creditors, so the accumulation of, of that deficit. Um, the estimate for 2015 stands at about $468 billion for our, our deficit, and that's a little bit of an improvement over 2014, where it was $483 billion. Um, both of those numbers are better than the $680 billion shortfall that we had in 2013. So 
slowly. I know hundreds of billions of dollars sounds like a ton of money, um, but it is getting a little bit smaller. So once we think through the sort of general issue of federal funding, what happens next? Here's where we are, the appropriations timetable. The president has submitted his budget request. He did that in February. We can check that off. Um, we are here right now. You're here before the House and Senate budget resolutions, if, if those are to come out. Um, you're here before the Appropriations Committee and the House and Senate get their amount of money that they can allocate to these important programs. Um, you're even here before hearings get started, which we're, we are um, hearing will happen any day now. Um, the House in June or July, theoretically, will have a floor debate on the, each of the 12 spending bills that they are in charge of. The Senate will, in parallel, adopt their own budget resolution, their own appropriations bill. Again, this is theoretically. Um, throughout September, they would then come together to iron out any differences between each of their respective bills and send it to the president for signature or veto all by September 30th because the next fiscal year, fiscal year 2016, starts October 1st. Sounds great. <laughs> In reality, it almost never happens that way. Um, it's good to know where we're supposed to be and sort of where we are, right? Um, so it rarely works as it should. Um, you often hear a continuing resolution or CR for short. Um, that's sort of a, a parachute for the annual appropriations process. It funds the government in the absence of uh, an actual appropriations bill. Um, and in general, it funds programs at their current level. So there's no increases. There may be a little bit of a cut. There may be some sort of anomaly. But generally speaking, you're just going to continue on everything that's happening from the previous fiscal year. Um, we've had in the past few years these sort of new phrases of what we could see. Um, when bills are not passed on their own, I mentioned there's 12. When they bundle them all together, it's called an omnibus. Uh, Congress could also bundle a few of them together. That's called a minibus. Um, fiscal year 2013 was the year of the cromnibus, which is now like a real term, I guess, um, which is a combination continuing resolution for some agencies and then, you know, a real spending bill for others. Um, and then I put in here a little timeline, the year of the cromnibus, fiscal year 2014 was the year of the government shutdown. Um, fiscal year 2015, which we are currently in, was another cromnibus year. So just to put this in perspective, because um, I think every time somebody passes a CR, we're like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, we passed a CR, this never happens. It, it happens often. Um, with the exception of 1989, 1995, and 1997, um, at least one continuing resolution has been enacted for each fiscal year since 1954. Um, so for more than a decade, we've had a CR in some form to partially or fully fund the government. And you might notice these longer ones happen during election years. Um, so just something to keep in mind as, as you're going up to the hill. Um, I mentioned fiscal year 2013. We saw this newfangled cromnibus, which is, is now being used again. Um, for labor, health, and human services appropriations, which funds the National Institutes of Health, the health, health programs, it does not fund FDA. FDA is funded under agriculture. Um, but labor HHS is one of the more controversial bills. It, it's huge. Um, it's the largest spending package on the non-defense non discretionary side. Um, it's really hard to pass. <laughs> it's really hard to even get a bill into the subcommittee. So um, the last time we actually saw a standalone labor HHS bill was in fiscal year 2006. Um, the last time it was on the floor was 2007. So just keep that in mind in the back of, the, in the back of your minds. Um, where did we come from? So aside from our sort of regular order, what should be happening, what actually happened, from our perspective at the Coalition for Health Funding, the sort of face of advocacy has changed. Our strategy has changed over the past few years. Um, in 2011, the Budget Control Act was passed. Um, that's where the so-called super committee came from all those years ago that everybody, I think, has sort of forgotten about. That's where sequestration came from because that super committee didn't get its job done. Um, we had sequestration, which was an across-the-board cut to all programs, projects, and activities in 2013. Um, 
and there's a typo here, we're not moving backwards in time, um, the cuts to the spending caps are from fiscal year 2014 to fiscal year 2021. So we are still under these spending caps. Um, we saw the government shut down in October 2013. Um, we saw then House Budget Chairman Ryan and Senate Budget Chair uh, Murray come together for an agreement. It was a two-year agreement um, that reopened the government, and it did provide some partial relief to that sequester. Um, but the fact remains, we are back under these spending caps uh, in fiscal year 2016 and beyond. So here is that chart. So you can see what the Budget Control Act did in terms of, of uh, budget caps. And this is only caps to that NDD side. Um, defense is a different story, but it's a similar, in a similar vein. Um, you can see the spending cut, the spending going down. That dark blue piece is the Ryan Murray budget agreement. So the little teeny tiny bump up in discretionary spending. Um, and then in 2016, you can see there, we're back under those caps. So $474 billion to fund every single program um, ex you know, that is not defense. So we're talking research, we're talking education, FAA, uh, criminal justice, all of these programs together um, are coming under these caps. Um, so I think it's important to think through, even with this number, um, if you look at the caps that are put into place, if you adjust it for inflation, um, that 2016 cap is about 17% below fiscal year 2010. So that's not a good place for us to be in. Um, I mentioned we had Cromnibus 2.0 in fiscal year 2015. The CR part is Homeland Security. It was the only part that was under a continuing resolution. You may have been reading a little bit or hearing a little bit in the news about um, this issue because that CR part expires on Friday. Um, so you know the president and congressional leaders are working to try to find some sort of solution uh, to, to make sure that that part of the government does not shut down. Um, everything else was funded through the end of the year. I point out here NIH had a very small increase of $149.7 million, 0.5%. It's not a cut. Uh, it certainly does not keep up with medical inflation, which is 2.2%. Um, FDA as well did have a 2.2% increase over a last year, which includes the user fees, but um, when the bill was passed, the Congressional Committee did note that FDA has grown 60% in the last five years, and they did express concern that oversight of FDA has not kept pace with growth in the agency's regulatory authority or funding. So they're putting up red flags uh, about FDA's funding, but they only have so much to work with. So here we are at the beginning of the fiscal year 2016 budget and appropriations process. Here we are now with our new political realities. We have a new Senate majority. Um, you know, what, what does that mean? What's our outlook? I cannot stress enough that sequestration is back in full form in 2016. We've been, you know, we did a Hill Day last week with new members of Congress talking about this and it was eye-opening. Um, some of the staff didn't realize that sequestration would be back, so it is back. Um, there is, however, a desire for what's known as regular order. Uh, new Senate Majority Leader McConnell is a former appropriator. He likes process. He would like to see, uh, you know, this process come back. Um, and then the president did take the first swing here in his budget request. Um, this chart here shows what the president's request would do with those sequester cuts. So you see that 17% cut right there on, on non-defense, and then the president's budget has 11%. Um, it's small relief, it's not much, but it, it's sort of a, a starting point. I'd like to point out NIH Budget Authority just to give you some context. Um, you know, you can see sort of a bump up in fiscal year 2010, 2009, 2010. Um, there was a stimulus bill, that's where that comes from. And then you can see those sequestration cuts in fiscal year 2013. Huge down, downside there. And we don't have fiscal year 2015 in this chart. Um, but it, it's pretty close to where it is now. I mentioned that 0.5% increase. Um, so NIH is, has not been immune to cuts in the past. This is not sort of their first time at the rodeo. Um, I put this up for historical context, that 5% cut from sequestration in 2013. Um, but they've been targeted before. 
and they probably will be targeted again, and these cuts are not inconsequential. Um, if we look at FDA budget authority, we see sort of a similar story. Um, it's been pretty much the same numbers here, um, and, and so you can see sort of just a steady amount um, up through 2014. Um, and as I pointed out, even Congress is concerned about the FDA's ability to do its job. So as we think about new treatments, drug development, um, especially drug development for rare diseases, you know, I think we probably could question whether or not FDA is able to do their job given their budget. So the changing face of advocacy. It's a totally different world. I worked on the Hill um, in the early 2000s and would come in and meet with groups. Um, they would ask for our, our support on something and we'd say, absolutely, yes, we'll sign your letter, we'll, we'll support this, we'll talk to the appropriations chairman. That's, it's just very different now. Um, there are more constraints, I think, that offices are working under. Um, so we, as sort of the advocacy, um, in the advocacy world, talking about public health programs, um, we now lobby on the budget resolution. We do not tend to lobby on the budget resolution. It's so boring. Like, what does that mean for us? But we need to make sure we get the, high, the top line numbers, the highest that we can, so that when we get down to the appropriations process, we can talk about what these programs actually mean and what funding for those programs means. Um, we work together with all groups. We work to, we've worked with education and, and those in the workforce community. We've branched out to transportation, housing. Um, all of those NDD groups were working together um, so that we can then get to the point where we're talking about these programs. So I mentioned we wrote a report. I showed you our little report. We wrote one with the full NDD community back in, when was that, 2013? And we, you know, just wanted to do it again because we love writing reports. We did it in 2014 focused on health. You can go to cutshurt.org and you can, it's all on PDF. Um, we do letters. We just came out with a letter from um, on the NDD side where we had 2,100 signatures talking about this issue. Um, continued education awareness, pounding the pavement, making sure that all of our members are visible and the programs that they care about um, are out there. Um, so I would close with a cute meme. Um, <laughs> hopefully I've held your attention. It can be a little wonky, um, but it's very important, again, that you all are here and continue to talk about this. Um, our executive director always says, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the table, and we're talking about programs that are not even like the free dinner. We're like the dinner roll on the side, not even like with butter. Um, these are such small, I mean, they're so small, so we really need to continue to advocate for them, and um, I hope I was able to give you a little bit of context about um, you know what could be happening in the next year or so, so thank you thank you Katie